Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hey everybody, this is Dr. John, and a quick PSA regarding my new virtual men's group that meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Pacific time. There's only a few spots left, but I thought you might want to know about it. It's a quick, easy, and cheap way to work with me. And maybe some of you have a career. Maybe you've made some money. Maybe you have a reputation for yourself at work. But maybe what you lack is things like happiness or purpose, a fulfilling relationship or a healthy sex life, the passion, happiness, and ease that you once had with your spouse an emotion other than numbness, disconnection, or irritability. This group is for men who are trying to be values-driven, interested in lifelong learning, and curious about how to become the best possible versions of themselves. The group is not for men who want to remain in the comfort zone while sitting at home watching TV. So again, group meets weekly, Wednesday, 7 p.m., It's only $95 per session, and you can call 510-863-0057 for more details. That's 510-863-0057. And now, on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. John back with the latest episode of the Evolved Caveman podcast. And today, I'm really excited to have, I guess, what I would consider an old friend. Uh, you know, I, I guess it's all relative, but I've known Alex for a couple of years, and I, I love what he has to say and what he does. I really respect his work. But my guest today is Alex Terranova. Alex, and, and this is directly from him, so I'm not, you know... <laughs> being overly rude when I say this. Alex describes himself as a recovering asshole, a success and business alchemist and coach. And he's been doing this for almost 10 years. He's a two-time author and he has the Dream Mason podcast. And he is co-founder of Alchemy for Men, Alchemy of Men, Alchemy of Men, Alchemy yeah. of Men yeah. which does men's retreats and groups and some other cool stuff. Welcome, Alex. How you doing? Oh, good man. I love how you just posed that. I don't want to like I don't want to call him a name, basically. Well, yeah. <laughs> well I was like, shit, I, I love what you were saying, recovering asshole. But then for me to come out and say, you're a recovering asshole, right? <laughs> you just say yep. it's really bad. You know, it's it's one of my favorite. I don't know where it came from or how I first shared that or said that out loud, but I remember, you know, I've never had a drug problem, I've never had an alcohol problem. I've had moments in my life where I use those things maybe unconsciously mm -hmm. or not with intention, but I was lucky enough to always be able to be the kind of person who like I could go hardcore and I could just stop. And it wasn't right. Everybody doesn't have that luxury, but when it came to being a jerk or an asshole, that seemed to be a, like an addiction that I was really connected to. Like it was a big part of my identity. It was like ruffling feathers, pushing people's buttons, getting a rise out of people and really, what I really got to was I didn't like myself. So instead of actually dealing with that, I was like kind of being shitty to everyone else. Well, and it's, it's funny in the sense that I think that's how we're raised or how we were socialized as young boys, right? Like I think yeah. about like, how did you um, interact with your male friends in middle school and high school? Like to me, it was all sarcasm, put downs, one up and chip, your mama jokes, you know? Like, oh yeah. It, there was no depth. It was all yeah. about you know, making yourself look better by putting others down. So, you know, in order to survive, we get really good at it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I mean, at some level, I guess all of us men are recovering assholes. You know, I think I'm in different to different degrees, right? I think I somehow also got a level of from, from family stuff. Like there was a lot of judgment, a lot of assessing based on like looks and money and all these things, which again, I think you're saying we, we all do that a little bit, but I noticed that mine was really hardcore. That was like how I brought, how I showed up was like immediately judging and assessing other people. And then like chopping them down with like my words or, or these things and putting it on loudspeaker. And I think as I got, we got older, whether I be with men or women or, or other people may were, maybe we're not doing it as much. And I still was, um, and I noticed it was getting in the way. It was like, it was like a drug. It's like, if I could bring somebody else down in a funny way, it mm. made me feel better, but then I had to keep doing it. Right. It's like getting, taking a hit. And at 30 years old, 
I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm entertaining, right? I'm, I'm very entertaining to be around. I'm very bold. I say the thing I want, but to what end and to what, to what effect? And ultimately it was like, I'm losing in the end because every time I do it, it's like I'm a little piece of my soul is getting like chipped away. When, and I remember back in middle school having this realization of just like, you know, wow, I'm really good at this. Like I seem to have a knack for finding people's soft spots and really (laughs) eviscerating them if I want to. But I realized pretty quickly that I didn't like it when it was done to me. Like Mm. I didn't like how that felt. And so I was like, huh, maybe I need to come up with a different form of humor. And so I I think I shifted more into like self-deprecating humor. Sure. Totally. At that that. point, not, not exclusively, but yeah. Because you still I, survive at some level. I still, to this day, will say my love language is being roasted. <laughs> but, and here's the thing. When people are roasting you, there's usually some reverence and some love for who you are, right? We're not... We're, we're, the, it's kind of the idea with the roast. is like, you know, the roast of Bill Murray. It's like all these people that really love Bill Murray, we're just going to like be mean to him, but we're going to... And we're going to poke fun at him. But everyone knows we love him, right? Right. And I think I love that. I love when my friends rag on me, when my, when my fiance rags on me. I love when she imitates me and makes fun of me. Also, one of the things that I love about that is she usually does it about my unconscious patterns and behaviors. And so she does it. It makes me laugh. And so then instead of holding the things that I'm trying to work on or grow or change with such heaviness and seriousness, it brings levity to them, which I think makes them easier. Now, it's not as much fun being roasted by people you don't know. That's what I was going to ask. simply being mean. But I will say I had an experience recently with some online trolls who were like the Andrew Tate lovers of the world who came after me. And I actually realized... I could have fun with these people. I could actually let that kind of shadowy side of myself go play with them. And I can kind of do take the more intellectual digs while they're taking the low ones. Yeah. And it was fun for a moment. But then at the same time, I was like, oh, this is not what I'm committed to. I'm not committed to like making fun of guys that are like in their mom's basement, you know, or like some lawyer who has an uh, account and he's miserable in his life. So he goes and trolls people, which right. is, was an actual person that I was experiencing. Um, yeah, it was a, I had like a, a week long experiment where I just like messed with trolls and I, I learned a lot about me, but I also learned a lot about. Well, so let me ask you this. Did you change any of the trolls minds? Oh, no, of course yeah. not. No. That's, well, that's that's what I think our <laughs> hope is, right? And I would argue that it's never going to happen because they're too entrenched in their own worldview. Yeah. I did have one say that he was like, that was mean what you said to me. And I was like, 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 oh my God, dude, it was, it was, I had this guy come at me like hardcore and I just came back and I just, and I think a lot of them don't expect that. They don't expect yeah. like, hey, you're going to, I'm going to punch back. And the guy was like, oh, clearly you can't take uh, you can't take someone who disagrees with you. And I was like, what you said wasn't a disagreement. What you said to me was you just being a jerk. Uh-huh. And I was like, you want to disagree with me? That's fine. But you actually threw it. You actually threw a spear at me. And so you throw a spear. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to defend myself and I'm going to come back. And, and then he was like, and what you said was mean. And I was like, well, so consider, you know, if you throw a punch, you might get punched back. Right. Yeah. And and I think that's where I was like, oh man, I'm so not committed to this because I'm not actually committed to punching back. I'm not actually committed to getting in fights. I'm committed to to holding my ground and staying safe. But like these people weren't actually putting me in any danger, yeah. right? So I didn't need to throw spears back. Well, may I ask what some of the insults were? Because I, I think <laughs> yeah, there's oh, always yeah. <laughs> worth in that to make other men aware of what the games we play are. Okay. Yeah, totally. So let me, let me preface with one of the things I said, which got people triggers. I, all I said was, which I didn't even go, I wasn't even mean. I just said that people that follow people like Andrew Tate or other, let's say, um, very authoritarian, classic masculine voices are speaking to men who are actually really afraid. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of the world changing. They're afraid of their roles changing. They're afraid of like, what does it mean to be a man now? And that those, those, those very powerful authoritarian like voices comfort us because we're like, Oh, this is what I know. This is what I'm used to. This is, this guy is like holding that path and I can just follow that and it's safe. Right. And 
totally get it. It makes perfect sense. And, and I kind of shared that. And I think some of these people got triggered because I said they were afraid, right? Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, And so I got things like some stuff I didn't even know. I got one that was like, oh, this is a, a soy boy, which I was like, what is a soy boy? <laughs> which, right? <laughs> I'm like over here. Soy eating. milk drinker. It's yeah. It's like a California guy who's like, ah, oh, no meat, please. Can I have tofu? Yeah. Um, and I'm over here sitting here like eating a steak while I'm reading these yeah. comments, which it wouldn't even matter. Even if I was eating tofu, like, what does that mean? How is what I eat denote about how I, who I am as a man? So yeah, to throw down a challenge to your masculinity, to your toughness, manliness. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of them was, uh, this is, this is pretty kind of messed up because people might be into this, but one guy was like, oh, this is what every man says right before he gets pegged. Um, again, and I laughed when I read it and then I was like, oh, this was great. He gave me some great ammo to sleep. So, right. Yeah. He's, so he's checking your sexuality. He's checking my sexuality. sexuality. Yep. Um, there were ones about, there was, there were things about, um, yeah, this is all sweet and nice, but when the, when the war comes or when it's time to like, when it's time to fight, it's like guys like you are going to want guys like us or something. Right. So it's my toughness, my strength. Yep. Um, one guy said I had a dad bod. <laughs> which, which was like, so, so the funny thing was when I looked at some of these profiles, you know, the, they're like, you know, pimply faced 20 year olds. Yeah. The dad bod guy is like, not somebody who you'd put on a cover of a magazine, yeah. you know, um, one of the, one, a, a lot of them are anonymous, no, nothing on their profiles. And I would call that out. I'm like, oh yeah, you're really tough with your anonymous program. One guy writes me back. I'm a lawyer. Oh, so, so you're actually so afraid to be yourself. Yeah. Like it, 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 there was a lot of stuff too about, uh, I'm a beta uh-huh. and guys would yeah. be like, oh, he's a beta. And then other guys would be like, yeah, yeah, he's a beta. And I would sit there and be like, wait a minute. If you're jumping on someone's coattails, calling some, like th- that is the definition of beta, right? Like, well, and, and, <laughs> and I think, you know, obviously it's a little bit of a straw man argument because these guys aren't here, but, um, yeah. I also think that that beta insult is interesting for people that are doing serious men's work because to me, the the real courage, and I guess there's different variations of courage, like it takes courage to fight in a war, but there's another form of courage, which takes going inside and looking at how you feel and what are your needs and what are your values, and then sharing that with other people, knowing full well that you may not get the desired reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Like learning to be vulnerable is scary as hell. Totally. And what about, what about the guys who like, like a guy like Muhammad Ali, who was like, I'm not going to go fight in a war. Yeah. Right. Did that make him, is he, is he, is Muhammad Ali a pussy? Because no, absolutely not. Right. He actually, he, he was, that is the ultimate alpha move of saying, yep, I'm going to do what's right. Even if I'm bucking the, the powers that be or, or the, the trends or whatever. Right. Yeah. I think that's the ultimate morality, that idea of I'm going to act in accordance with my values, even against the, the nation's laws, which say otherwise, and I go to jail as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, to me, the highest level of moral development to me. Yeah. And to me, I don't, I don't really think alpha beta, I think it's like, it it makes, it really just throws people into boxes. I think about like, what I think is, is, are you a leader as a man? And are you holding your masculinity from that place? And to me, if I have to have someone else tell me what that means, then I'm not a leader. Leaders carve their own path. Leaders define their, their role and what they're leading for on their own. They don't have an instruction booklet on, oh, well, you know, these five people told me this is how I should do it. And I think that's where you really see a clear divide. Even, even recently I was with a group of guys and the guy's like, well, doesn't that make you like a beta or an alpha? And I was like, dude, you're, you're caught in this like binary thing where it's like, choose what are you committed to? What do you want? That's what is actually going to give you the life that you want. Not trying to figure out if you're in the right A or B group. Yeah. Not trying to figure out what what category you belong to, but rising above that and playing your own game based on your own values. 100%. Yeah. Well said. Um, and there's, I mean, the other stuff too, self-awareness, emotional awareness, communication. But, um, but yeah, I think that's one of the things that I'm really feel strongly about, I suppose, is th- there's not just one ideal form of masculinity. I would say there's hundreds or thousands. Like they, they vary quite a bit. Wow, wow, wow. Sorry, my I'm, I can't hear you. Oh, wait, I don't know what happened. 
I can hear you now. Can Sorry, you hear me now? we just lo- we just lost each other. So I didn't okay. hear. I'm like no, clicking. I'm like, why is why did my volume go out? But you just came back. What did you say? Sorry, Technology. I have no idea what I said. Uh, I think <laughs> I said something about I feel strongly about um, this idea, but now I can't remember the idea, which means I must not have felt very strongly about it. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah. So let's talk about some of the positive aspects of masculinity. Like. Yeah. What do you see that we're evolving towards or shooting for? Where do you see us headed? Because I think that's a really interesting conversation as well. Yeah. So my favorite parts of, of let's just, I'll just speak about me because I'm having this experience as a man. My favorite parts of my masculinity are the safety that I get to create, but not through my muscles. The safety that I get to create through my heart really is, is the kind of the way I want to think about it. You know, I've been, I've had some experiences with women lately where what they shared with me was I felt so safe because of the space, the energy you held, the, the, like you weren't trying to have sex with me, you know, get at me, do anything. You just were there with me, Mm -hmm. which I would describe as like being present Mm -hmm. and attentive and focused and listening and commute. And like the way I was able to communicate, um, how how would you describe that form of communication? Um, like gently, so I think it's not telling people it's, it's like asking questions. Okay. So being more curious than knowing. Okay. Um, and then sharing things from, um, how would I say, uh, like offering things up, like, off, like offering from service. I think service is a really cool, instead of me trying to help you or do some, if I have to help you, it means there's something you can't do on your own. Right. If I need to support you, it's also kind of like a like maybe I need some I need that a little bit. But if I'm simply from service, like hey, I'm offering you this this idea that I have, it's kind of like take it or leave it. Service is like you don't actually need it. It's just like a gift I'm I'm kind of giving. Um, so I think that as men, we, what what I had to do to create that space is I had to actually share my heart. I had to be vulnerable. I did not know everything. I did not have an answer to all their problems. Um, and some of those moments were just this one woman in one situation was like having kind of full emotional breakdown. And I just sat with, I just literally sat there with her and I just had one hand on like her back, like, a, like behind her. And I actually at one point put my other hand like on her chest and I just sat and held her and didn't say anything. Right. Like the, the traditional man is like, I need a salt. I need to fix this. Yeah. I was okay with her being exactly where she was which actually shows my faith and my trust in myself and my security with that her emotions are okay and I'm okay with them. And that I just held her from like, I'm here. Well, it also shows your emotional evolution because you can, you're able to sit with her discomfort, mm-hmm. her emotion. And I, I think a lot of us men really struggle with that, that, you know, I'll tell my male clients like, look, you know, ask your wife when she's venting about work, for example, you know, I, I want to support you now. Do you want me to just listen? Do you want me yeah. to try and fix this? Or do you want to hug? I love that. And yeah. most times they'll say, you know, I, I just need you to listen. Yep. But then we start listening and they're upset or they're anxious or they're stressed or they're scared or whatever it is. And we can't deal with yeah. what we're picking up from them due to our empathy. Yeah. And so then we go back to trying to fix it. So if we can't be with our, those feelings on our own, we're not going to be able to be with them with other people, right? If I, if I can't be with my sadness, then when someone else brings sadness, I'm not going to be comfortable with their sadness. Cause I actually, when I feel sadness, I need to get out of it. So when they bring it, I need to, we need to get out of it too. I think for anger too, a lot of guys, either their anger flies off. They they don't have, I think of anger as like a fire. Fire can warm the house and be this beautiful thing that we can like stare at, or it can burn the whole thing down. Yeah. And if we don't get, and, and a lot of men, because of their dads or society have like tamped down their anger, like anger is a bad thing. It's, we, we, I don't want to, I don't get angry. I don't want to get angry to understand like, no, you can like have that controlled rage, that controlled fire. If you can't have that within yourself, when other people get angry, same thing, you're going to be like uncomfortable with it. You're not going to like right. it. You're going to, you're going to have to fight against it. Something's going to happen. And I think that's where, as I see my masculinity evolving, as I've done the work to become more comfortable inside of my own self with my own emotions, then when women bring their emotions, I'm comfortable with them. Which the ironic, the funny thing is, I'm I'm not single. I'm not like using this. 
it creates so much heavy actual attraction, mm-hmm. right? Those women are then drawn more oh, to yeah. me. They want, they feel safe. They feel comfortable. They actually want the things that most of us guys are wanting from them, but it's, it, and, and it's, but it's doing it in a way, right? I'm not trying to get that. I'm actually just trying to let them be who they are. Right. And to let them be who they are, I have to be who I, who I am. And I think that's another level of where I think masculinity needs to evolve to is I talk about this a lot is truth is men speaking their truth. Men are walking around holding their truth in their chest, whether it be, you know, when a, but when a guy asks you how you are, your buddy asks you how you are and you're like, I'm fine. Right. You didn't say what's really going on yeah. or you're with your my, my fiance says some, this to me all the time. She'll be like, oh, do you, do you like this thing we're doing? And I'm like, babe, you know that I will tell you if I don't like something. You know if I will tell you that we need. And she's like, you're right. You always do. Right? And so we, we're so afraid that if we say what we are really thinking or what we really believe, that it's going to often cause like these disruptions or these problems. But then we're not living in, in reality with other people in our relationships. We're living in the made-up realities in our head. And I think, so I think the evolution of masculinity is to know that we can speak our truth and we can clean up our messes. We can actually, um, we, we can, we can like live in reality with the people we care most about, but that requires that vulnerability and that, that, that faith and that and self-awareness, self-awareness, self-awareness like you know what yeah. you're feeling, you gotta know what your values are. Um, yeah. And the flip side of that situation is if you're walking around holding your truths in your chest or your asshole or wherever you hold those truths, <laughs> um, it, it varies for each of us. Um, then if you're not speaking your truth, you're by definition going to build resentment and those mm-hmm. resentments are going to accumulate until the point where you just, the fire burns down the house, the yeah. anger comes out and you go volcanic and. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, I think this, there's a thing that should needs to be mentioned is our truth is not our judgments and our assessments and our opinions. That's not our truth. That's our momentary thoughts that we have. Our truth is saying, I love you, not knowing if someone's going to say it back. And, and that being a hundred percent. Okay. Like what, how terrifying is saying, I love you, not knowing if they're going to say it back. What more makes you a strong, brave person than putting yourself out there like that? Right. Yeah. You know, and I'll have guys say to me like, oh no, you can't let a woman know how you, that, that, that like puts all your chips. It takes all your power away. And I'm like, you've never had more power than when you say, I love you and you're not attached yeah, to the result. I agree. And, and on that topic of love, like if you're really in love with someone, I, I think it's an interesting kind of I don't know if it's an emotional paradox, but that real in-depth love also is an accompany is accompanied by fear. Hundred percent. If you're if you're absolutely honest with yourself, because the fear is that I'm giving my heart for someone else to hold and to protect and to be gentle with, and there's no guarantees that that's going to happen. Nope. Yeah. Well, um, go ahead. Well, here's the thing. Ultimately, it's going to get broken. Also, eventually. Yeah. Because no matter what, someone's going to die eventually. So if you live 50 years with your soulmate and it's all perfect and she never breaks your heart, one day you're going to die and it's going to break hers. Yeah. Or she's going to die and it's going to break yours. That ultimately love comes with heartbreak. They're they're intrinsically connected and will never not be. Disappointment, conflict misunderstanding, yeah. all that stuff. Let me let me change subject a little bit. Yeah. What are your thoughts in terms of men's evolution, in terms of taking responsibility for oneself versus externalizing blame onto everyone else? <laughs> well, I, I mean, as a as a recovering asshole who blamed everyone else for his problems, his bosses, his relationships, um, I think the evolution of all humans, not just men, be, be, is when we start looking at personal responsibility. Yeah. When we start to say, "Hey, my job is a mess because I like because of me. My relationships are a mess because of me. My health is a mess because of me." And again, that gives you your power back. That actually gives you the opportunity to do something about the situation, yeah. right? If I even look at like the jobs that I had when I was younger, I look back and I'm like, "Okay, there were a lot of bad bosses. They were not good leaders. They were bad bosses." I, I but why didn't I quit the job? 
right? Why didn't I leave? Right. So even though, even in a situation where you are impacted by other people, I had choices that I chose to stay in a bad job, be victimized because of either golden handcuffs or because I was afraid I wouldn't get another job or because I was lazy, whatever that, 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 um, that taking responsibility, not for the boss to become a better boss, but for to me to change my situation. Mm-hmm. And that has, has made a huge impact. Man, the money I make, the, the, my business, my relationship, these things are all the best they've ever been. And I have the best clients I've ever had and the best retreats I've ever done because we're like, if something's not right, how do we own that we created it that way? And then how do we own that we're going to change it to make it the way we want it to be? Yeah. And, and I agree with you a hundred percent. And I think I've just seen so many men get stuck in that anger loop where when we get angry, we're externalizing blame onto others and it's, you know, all someone else's fault. And the problem with that is it takes away our power. It yeah. also takes away our ability to evolve and develop ourselves because yeah. if it's, if everything is someone else's fault, then what's the, you know, I have no need to look at myself and, Look at yeah. what, what's my part in the play, so to speak. Yeah. Do you notice that anger is often on top of sadness? Like anger is a is an easier oh yeah thing for men well, than sadness. Anger is often on top of a lot of things potentially. I mean, they say anger is a secondary emotion. I don't think it has to be a secondary emotion. In other words, it comes quickly on the healing heels of another, but it often is. So we know that male depression yeah. comes out as irritability. Like there's a lot of anger in male depression. I've seen it come out, you know, guilt, shame, anxiety, embarrassment, sadness, all those can quickly flip to anger in men. I, I notice, yeah, I, I don't know that you're more, way more of an expert on, on the emotional thing, like the emo, the, let's say the distinctions of emotion that I am. I know, I notice more from being with men and working with them that anger is either, uh, is often easier to be with than sadness mm-hmm. or they don't do anger. They usually, they might not do sadness either. Yeah. They like deflect the, all these things away. I think that anger is a great data point. You know, if I'm angry about something, what is that information telling me what's underneath that? So I'm angry about, I don't know. I'm angry that I'm planning, you know, I share this with you. I'm planning a wedding. I'm angry that the bill just went up three K right well, ouch. Okay. Right. Like why, why am I angry about it? It's like, okay, because three K is hard to make, let's say, Mm -hmm. well, or maybe I don't think I can make the three K or maybe I'm worried about money that, right. We get, we start getting into that. Or maybe that all comes back to, I don't have enough money. And as a man, now I feel like I'm not doing a good job. I'm a failure or I'm letting my fiance down. So all this stuff is on top of that belief, which we never get to address that belief when we're like sitting in the anger. And I think we can powerfully let that energy of anger out, right? We let that fire rage. I box, I go to the gym. Um, I think it's perfectly okay to like go beat up like a pillow, a punching bag, some weights. It's perfect to go outside and scream at the top of your lungs and let like energy out. But it's not okay to like punch your neighbor in the face yeah. because he parked in front of your garage and he happens to be the person that you bump into right when you're, when, when all these other things are stacked up on top right. of each other, which is, I think right. how it often goes. Right. Or yeah. And I partner. like that distinction between the emotion you feel and how you behave as a result of that emotion. And I think so often we fuse those two together. Like I'm angry because the guy parked in my driveway without asking. So I'm going to punch him in the face. Mm-hmm. And I punched him because I was angry yeah. versus I'm angry because the guy parked in my driveway. Well, okay, let me rein that in a little bit. Let me take a second. Okay. How can I best deal with this? And okay, let me go talk to him and say, Hey man, I'm, I'm a little bit annoyed that you took my spot in the driveway. Can you move your car, please? Yeah. And, well, and what's even the thing? It's just a funny, somebody parked in front of my driveway the other day and like I opened, <laughs> I opened the garage and there was a truck literally blocking my garage. And I noticed I got angry, but you know, if, if we step back a second, why am I angry? If there's a car in front of my garage, right? Like I actually wasn't pulling my car out of the garage. It didn't matter. I was, I was, I was opened it cause I took the dog out that way. What I but noticed if you was wanted to pull the car out if I had wanted to, but what I, yeah, <laughs> but what I noticed was there was a, the anger was on top of I'm being disrespected. 
my space isn't being honored, which may, which then is like, if as a man, I'm not respected and you're not honoring like my little castle, my space, then you're like taking my masculinity away from me. Yeah. And, and so, right. So, but then I get to, it's like, wait a minute. None of that's happening. <laughs> that guy, the, the guy was a painter. He thought he was parked in the right driveway. He didn't realize it was a, it was yeah. a total mistake. But we, I made up this whole story, right? On top of like being disrespected. Well, and that disrespect interpretation screws up, up so many people. Like I'm always calling people out on that. They're like, oh, that was so disrespectful. Like the teenager, he asked, you know, to clean his room and he rolls his eyes and like, and then he goes and cleans his room and the parent gets all triggered. Like that was so damn disrespectful. I can't believe he did that. Yeah. And I'm like, but was it really? Like, is that disrespect or is that just a unconscious nonverbal emotional cue, which says, I really don't want to do this. I'm kind of annoyed, but yeah. I'm going to go do it anyway. Yeah. Yep. And, and so I think we got to watch, you know, whenever that interpretation of that was so disrespectful comes up, ask yourself, is it really? Cause we, I think we overuse that a lot. hundred percent to your, I mean, your example is a good one. Like it was just a mistake. Like it had nothing to do with you. No. It wasn't intentional. No, it's yeah. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna screw this guy by parking in his face. Yeah. And when I and the guy I saw the guy, I was like, Can you move your truck? Now, if he had been like, no, man. Yeah, that's a different story. N- now, now it would have been like, okay, well, like, what's going on here? Like, I yeah. cause then I could easily go to that. Well, now he's really disrespecting me. Or maybe there's a reason. He's like, no, man, maybe his truck's broken. He can't, yeah. <laughs> he can't move it. I don't know. Or flat tires. But I think that we we have to so much of, I think so much of what prevents men from living the lives they want to live, whether it's the relationships, the happy relationships they want to have, the great sex they want to have, the job that they want to have, the money they want to have, the happiness, whatever it is, is all these things get tied to our masculinity. Because as men, we do this weird thing where it's like, what we do is who we are. So if we win a game, we're a winner. If we lose a game, we're a loser. If we if we um, make a lot of money, that makes us success. We are successful. If we have to declare for bankruptcy, we're like, I'm a failure. I'm a loser. Right. Instead of it like being just a thing that happened, right? It's we we do this weird. We like interpret it like it's shameful, right? It's like instead of oh, I did a bad thing or I messed up, it's like oh, I am a bad person. We do that with all of our actions. So then I think the we're we have to, to protect ourselves. We, we like to, to give us ourselves space and to protect ourselves when we, um, when these things happen, we're trying to uh, like make up other things like, Oh, I'm being disrespected. That guy's invading my space. That guy shouldn't have talked to my girl like that. My boss shouldn't talk to me like that, blah, blah, blah. Versus it's just being like, no, no, no. None of it means anything about who you are as a man. Right. It's just stuff that's happening to you. Well, and, and I think that's why the work we do is so important in the sense of I'm always trying to get a little bit of a gap or space between the mask we wear as a masculine person or a man and the true self. Because mm-hmm. why is it so important to us to be masculine? Like why why not just <laughs> for being human, for example, right? Like yeah. if I'm human rather if I define myself as human rather than yeah. as a man, then I have full I, I guess I have more permission to have full access to everything I feel, everything I think. Like it, it seems to be much more freeing in that regard. Hundred percent, and you can create so much outside of the masculine box, right? The right. masculine box is limited, just like the feminine box is limited. Yeah, the human box is exponentially expansive. I would say, and I don't think people like when I talk like this, is it supports the society that we built in the world, the the capitalistic patriarchal society. Now, let's let me also be really clear. I don't think capitalism is bad. I don't think men leading is bad. I don't think women leading is good or bad, right? I think none, none of it is good or bad. Mm-hmm. There's just consequences to things, right? In in a capitalistic society, we've decided that money is like the most important thing. Right. Like that's essentially what capitalism is, is the opportunity to generate wealth and that we put money on this kind of pedestal. Well, the consequence of that is that we sometimes put people secondary to money. Mm -hmm. We put ourselves secondary to money, our health secondary to money, our neighbor secondary to money, our education, our children. Right. We we do all these things. And I'm not again, not bad or good, just simply uh, uh, like um, cause and effect. Yeah. And I think that inside of this, 
world where men have had most of the power for most of human history to, to varying degrees, but they've had most of the power. Mm -hmm. Um, and capitalism being the so far most effective way to run a country or, or a nation. These, uh, those are capitalism and, and, um, democracy and patriarchy are driven by old masculine, um, old masculine like uh, ideals or values, yeah. right? So action, direction, goals, focus, um, commitment, discipline. And if we say, if we say, no, we need to like lean into more trust and faith and love and embodiment, those don't fit mm -mm. that structure. No, it doesn't mean they can't. I actually think they can. I think that, yeah. You know, a lot of women are demonstrating powerfully that those things can create a lot of success. Yeah. But they're not the way that it's always been. So I think we've been conditioned that like this masculine thing is so important and we need to protect it because if we don't, it's all going to fall apart. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's interesting to me because that whole concept of masculinity is socially created. It's cultural. And, and oh. we know this because it the same or very similar masculine ideals develop in every country that has bordering neighbors and a scarcity of natural resources. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me that at some level, this is culture's way of developing soldiers that are willing to take risks, be tough, ignore pain, be aggressive in order to protect the, the area in which they live. Okay, sure. That makes sense. And we need those people. I have no yeah. problem with that. But yeah. As you said earlier, I think they need access to all parts of their humanity, not just this traditional masculine mask. Um, and we also know that in lands that don't have neighbors that have plentiful natural resources, masculinity develops in a very different way. There's a, a tripolar model of masculine, feminine, and something in between in which either male or female can go in this middle ground. And it's absolutely accepted by mm -hmm. everyone in society. Um, and those are mostly island cultures, but we do see a, a, a difference, which to me points out this idea that masculinity is completely culturally yeah. derived. It's learned. Yeah. And it stays in place a lot from scarcity and fear, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I'll, often people will say to me, well, what happens when this happens? And I'm like, man, I don't know about you, but I've been alive for 41 years and I've not been under attack most of it. Yeah. There have been a few moments, right? Where I had to defend myself and like be tough, but for most of my life, what I've noticed as a man who's been around plenty of men in New York City, LA, San Diego, major cities, is men that are looking for trouble find trouble. Mm -hmm. Right? Men that are looking for war will find war. And men that are looking for peace will find peace. And that doesn't mean that the man who's looking for peace can't know how to defend himself if something shows sure. up on his doorstep. I think that's wise. Yeah, it's not right. It's it's like we can, we can, I have an earthquake kit. You know, not really, but like some water. I live in Southern California. Like there's some jugs of water, really. That's really all I have. I shouldn't, I shouldn't lie. I have a fire extinguisher and I have some water. And um, and the water's probably expired, <laughs> to be honest, right? So maybe not as prepared as I should be. But I'm not sitting around afraid of earthquakes, right? That's hence why it's not that. But yeah, I'm kind of like, oh, all right. I'm not going to sit around and be afraid of this thing. I'm going to live my life. And if that thing happens, I'll be ready. Yeah. So... I think that's where it's like, I go to the gym, I exercise, I do the things that keep my body, the quote unquote masculine strong. So if I need to be strong, I'm ready to be strong. But most of the people I know, most people that are listening to this show, most people have iPhones. They're not under attack yeah. in any way, shape or form. So to, to like live like you're ready to be attacked all the time, man, what is that doing to your nervous system? We wonder why cancer levels are insanely high, why depression, anxiety versus... Suicide, addiction. Yeah, it's like there's no... You know what? When the war comes, we can get ready for it. But right now... That, I mean, that autonomic nervous system, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, that's no, not meant to... That stress response is not intended to go in the on position and just stay in the on position yeah. for the rest of your life. That's yeah. not how it's supposed to work. And there yeah. are negative physical consequences and mental consequences from doing so. Yeah. But I find there's so many men that just stay stuck in that hypervigilant mode. Yeah. And I'm always trying to teach them, you know, hey, here's how you activate the relaxation response. You mm -hmm. know, this is important too. You have to learn how to rest and digest and hang out and like 
you know, because if you don't, your your digestion gets messed up, your sexual reproduction that gets messed up, your ability yeah. to heal your body gets messed up, brain, lungs, heart, just goes on and on. That's a great, yeah, that's a great uh, like tidbit right there that I think people, I think people flip it, the people from fear flip it the other way. They're like, no, look at how men's masculinity or testosterone is decreasing. And they blame that on like, we're getting soft. Mm -hmm. What I just heard you say, which I I probably think is just as valid or more true is we've had our, um, our nervous system on a fight, fight or flight for so long for our life. Our testosterone is just worn out. Like how long, how long can you stand ready for a war? Yeah. Right. For, for this and, or hold yourself in this tense position, right? It's, it's like you're draining yourself of the fuel. Well, but at a certain point you reach the stage of exhaustion when you have that stress response in the high alert position, like it it works for a little bit, but then you deplete your inner resources. Yeah. It's unsustainable. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, wow, we've covered a lot of ground here. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I know you do. We both love this is, <laughs> I just went, I just, I just went on a, a, a impromptu guys weekend getaway retreat. It was like a very unstructured, every guy brought like a different kind of like add value to this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like sort of an experiment that, uh, my trainer actually decided. And one of the things that was really cool is we taught, we had conversations like this all weekend. And none of the guys except for me do this for a living. So one guy's a lawyer, a business lawyer. One guy's a, a personal trainer. One guy creates, like designs websites. And then there were supposed to be three other guys who got stuck and couldn't Didn't make it up the mountain. Yeah, couldn't what, make it up the mountain. Um, what were the other guys' reactions to having conversations like this for a weekend? So they were super open to it. We did this really cool thing where we took, um, we hiked up the mountain during the blizzard. So we all got like put on our boots and everything. And we we just like needed to get out of the house. You know, we were like, yeah. let's, let's get all, all our stuff on and let's just like hike up the mountain. Um, and so there's a hiking trail. It's just covered in, you know, your boots are going into thick. Yeah. There were like 64 inches of snow. And as we hiked, I said, Hey, you guys want to do, you guys, they want to ask me to lead them in kind of an exercise. And I was like, why don't we do it while we're hiking? Right. Like we're doing this physical thing. We're sweating, like we're, we're putting in work and let's, uh, and so as we hiked up the mountain, I asked them a series of questions that we all took turns answering in a circle. And then when we were all done, we moved to the next guy or the next question, which was one, one question was, um, what are you most, I think it was like, what are, what's the hardest thing about being a man for you personally? And, all, and, and you know what? Almost every guy said the pressures to provide and be strong and like take care of, of women and to like be a success and like make it in the world and make a lot of money. And none, and all these guys are successful in different rights, but they all were like, like crippled by like how much pressure and anxiety this creates inside of them. Um, We asked, Hey, what's the best thing your dad did for you? Mm -hmm. And what's the thing you wish he hadn't done for you? Like, what's the thing that he did that you wish he hadn't done? And what was really interesting with that is guys wanted to justify the bad thing. So they'd be like, oh, my dad beat me. But like, it was good because look who I am now. And I was like, wait, wait. Maybe tough. Yeah. And it was like, wait, you just said it's the thing you want. Could it just be that you wish your dad hadn't beat you? Yeah. Right. We don't, you know, and um, we did the same thing with the mom. What did, what was the hardest thing about our mom that we wish hadn't been? And for almost all of it, it was like their anxiety. Like their, their fear in a lot of ways, there was other things too, but, yeah. and what was the best thing? And, and ultimately it was like, man, she loved us. Like she loved us so much. Right. Um, and, and then the we actually, from the dads, uh, the, the best thing about the dads was that they showed up all the dads. Um, luckily in this group was that all the dads were like, they recognized how hard they worked to put food on the table, that they came to their game, like their sports games, those kind of things. Um, But they all also talked about, they was like disconnected emotionally. There was no like real depth and connection with their dad, um, which was something that they, that they all wanted and missed. And then some of them are getting now older and like we're getting from our dads all their life. Luckily all these guys hadn't lost their parents. So all these things were still possible. Um, And then we got to what's something that you feel shame about that you don't talk about out loud. And we, and I had to, these guys don't all necessarily do the work. So I broke down what shame means so they could really like take a look. How at do you define it. shame? I think it's that thing that we were talking about before. It's like, I am the thing versus I did. So if I, I, the example I used for them is imagine I stole money from one of my buddies in my twenties 
I could go, I did a bad thing. I shouldn't have done that. That was, that was crappy. I, I was not, I was not a good friend. Um, shame is the, like the level where I go, I am a bad person. I'm a bad friend. Uh, I'm a criminal. I'm a crook. Um, it's the, I am versus I did a bad thing. Um, which I think is like a Brene Brown. I think that's her. Well, her definition is something like, um, shame is the belief that we are unworthy of connection, love and belonging, which okay. in your example is interesting because it's disconnection from self or I'm unworthy of connection from myself, mm. which is kind of interesting. Yeah, well, what I noticed, I, I, the way I got this was from, I actually was in a room, which was incredible. Um, Andrew Horn, a guy, a, a men's retreat leader who I, I really like and respect. At, at his retreat, we did this exercise where all, uh, it, it's a bigger exercise, but we all wrote down, it was like 15 guys all wrote down um, things they feel shame about. And we got to a point where he defined it in his way and we all wrote down. And then we all were blindfolded and he read them out loud. Mm. And almost every guy, it was like across, like things were really similar. I, you know, yeah. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. Uh, I'm gross. I'm fat. I'm unlovable. I'm a cheater. Um, I'm a fraud. All these things. And, and everyone didn't connect with everyone else's, but you could really hear it was these like negative, powerful negative beliefs about oneself yeah. that we don't talk about. Yeah. And so all the guys shared theirs as we walked, as we came back down. Um, and the guys said at the end, towards the end of the weekend, they were like, man, it's like the best part of the retreat was getting to share this stuff in a way that was non judgmental, you know, no advice being given, just simply like me saying, this is what I don't like about me, basically. When it, it normalizes others' experience. And I think it's it's interesting because we have this epidemic of you know disconnection among men, loneliness, suicide, all the other stuff. And I, I think one of the things that is contributing to that as a big contributor is this idea of shame that we believe these, we believe ourselves at some level to be bad people mm -hmm. or to be unworthy of connection. So if that's a belief at some level, why would I reach out to another man to start a new friendship? Yeah. Yep. Um, and I think it's a real, it's a real problem. And so I appreciate the work you're doing in, you know, retreats and groups um, because I think it's incredibly valuable. It's changing my it's changing my own life as much as it's Isn't changing. It wild? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I said it's impossible not to. Yeah, I used to avoid guys except for drinking, sports, and women, right? Like to go get chase women or whatever. And um, now the communities I'm creating, whether they be ones I'm leading or ones I'm throwing myself into, as like this weekend or that retreat I went on, and my life exponentially keeps getting better because of my relationships with, with men who are committed to having these kind of conversations. And, and, and again, like we're not just in there drinking beers and complaining about our jobs or watching sports. We're actually, you know, hiking up a mountain, having conversations like this, um, trying to help each other in our relationships. Yeah. Right. Like that was a lot big, a lot of stuff that came up this weekend was guys talking about their challenges with women and other guys, especially me, challenging their context or their belief system about women. Yeah. And them recognizing, oh man, maybe, maybe women aren't necessarily crazy. Maybe I'm doing something that's making all the women in my life behave a certain way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah. So on that note, I got to wrap up. I'd just be yeah. out of time. Um, yeah, yeah. But this has been a fantastic conversation. So thank you very much. I always enjoy our talks. And any, where can people get a hold of you if they would like to know more? Yeah, they can. They can find me on Instagram at Inspirational Alex. You can find me on my website, thedreammason.com. and there you can find everything: my books, my podcast, the Dream Mason podcast, and my retreats, which we're enrolling for right now for our summer retreat up in the mountains of Utah. That's it. Yeah, Utah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I got to check those dates with you actually as well. Yeah, dude, we'd um, love, love to have a guy like you out there. You know, there's guys, I should say guys of all levels, guys who are doing tons of work and want more and guys who are just starting out. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to go. Um, so that is it for this episode of The Evolved Caveman. Thank you very much to Alex Terranova. And if you really like this episode, please feel free to rate, review and share. And if you didn't like it, you don't have to do a damn thing. Thanks so much. <laughs> See you soon. 
Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 